U.S. government agencies are taking concerted steps to implement a zero trust architecture to protect critical systems and data. Those efforts include meeting a number of cybersecurity standards and objectives by the end of fiscal year 2024. I'm Wyatt Cash with Scoop News Group, and here to talk about that effort at the Department of Labor is the department's chief information security officer, Paul Blahush. Paul, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks, Wyatt. Thanks to you and uh, Scoop News for having me. So before we start, Paul, uh, just give us a sense of the Department of Labor's portfolio of responsibilities and the IT operations that support them. Sure. Um, Well, I guess we'll start with DOL is a CFO Act cabinet level agency, and our, our mission involves fostering, promoting, and developing welfare of job seekers, wage earners, and retirees, uh, improving working conditions, and assuring work related benefits and rights. We, we have 27 varying mission areas uh, publishing economic statistics like job numbers, inflation rate. We do employment services and training processing temporary work visas, apprenticeship opportunities, transitioning veterans to civilian life and workplace safety are just a few of these. Uh, We have about 75 to 80 information systems that support this mission. Each of these areas and their stakeholders depend on IT and the office of the chief information officer as a service provider for the IT solutions that enable their mission work. In all, we maintain an IT portfolio of over $700 million. And of course, as CISO, my job is to make sure these systems and the data that they they store and process are safe and secure. Well, that's a quick view into DOL and IT at at DOL. To learn more, um, you can follow us on Twitter at at OCIO underscore DOL. We also have a LinkedIn page. Thanks, Wyatt. Sure. Well, so as CISO, uh, what are your top priorities in the next year, uh, over the short term, if you will, and maybe over the next three years longer term to meet the federal zero trust security requirements? Well, that is, um, that's a really involved question in some ways. Uh, Let me start with by saying, you know, before addressing plans going forward, I think it's helpful to sort of describe where we are currently and, and, and some of the things that form the basis for this. Um, about four years ago, we started a shared an IT shared services uh, initiative, bringing kind of all the different IT that was in the Department of Labor under the authority of the Office of the Chief Information Officer. And I think that's gonna be an important point going, going forward in what I talk about, is that except for, um, a few notables where there was a policy or separation need to keep them separate, everything came under the OCIO. Also over the last several years, we've been investing in the plumbing or underpinnings of zero trust, I call it. There's been investments in identity credentialing and access management, in migrating to the cloud, whether it's Microsoft Office applications, other software as a service, or even custom applications that we're, we've done platform or infrastructure as a service out in the cloud. Uh, investment in SIM and SOAR technologies uh, and becoming mobile ready, which sure helped us during the, the, the pandemic. Um, so that was all kind of pre-EO. Now, after the executive order of May 2021, certainly the zero trust thing became important. So we established a zero trust architecture integrated project under our enterprise architecture group Security, what I represent, we were sort of positioned ourselves as the customer. We set requirements and EA was going to develop the solution. Now, this IPT has a project management office and assigned subject matter experts under the various pillars of Zero Trust. They've developed an overall strategy um, that I think the, the, the key component of it is a secure access service edge or SASE overlay. So that's, that's in the past. So looking forward for the next year. Um, for us, zero trust is revolutionary, not evolutionary. And I think what I mean by that is it's going to be an architectural change for us. It's going to take resources. It's going to take technology. It's going to take people. It's going to take uh, professional services. And there's going to be this transition period when much like if you were building a new house, you still need to live somewhere while you're building the new one. 
So you can imagine we're going to have costs of our current, cost of what we're going to, and for a while, they're going to be duplicative. So we need resources to do this. So that's all setting up to say my number one priority, if I was doing it for this, for current and, and, and looking forward a few months, maybe into a year, is to identify this fund. Um, looking for supplemental funding in the FY23-24 budget, unused funds, technology modernization funds, sort of the source and how much we can obtain there really dictates what we can do and how fast we can do it. Now, putting all that boring funding stuff aside, right? So what at a minimum are we, are we doing that? Well, we're, we're continuing, no matter if we get additional funding or not, we have to continue to lay that groundwork, that, that, that plumbing, completing things about ICAM, completing things with uh, data encryption, moving ahead as we can with the zero trust strategy to the extent possible. And, and in that way, leveraging existing modernization efforts to say, hey, you know, please align with these principles of zero trust as you're modernizing your system. Um, I think that um, if we do get the additional funding, we can certainly move ahead quicker and, and with both the ICAM and the encryption pieces. And really what we, we, we want to do is take that idea of getting that SASE overlay, go into a pilot, and then move that forward. That, that's going to be the big thing. Now, longer term, you're looking about three years out. And I'm going to put on some rose-colored glasses funding. I get funding to do this. So we're going to be in a good place then, I think. We, our plans show that we can have that SASE in place and mature across the enterprise, across the enterprise, um, including, at least in some fashion, in those independent infrastructure agencies I was talking about who didn't come under shared services. Our, our ICAM solutions, that's with an S on the end, will be complete and leveraged for determining uh, the trust of identity for all authenticated connections, both internal uh, um, employees and contractors, as well as partners and the public where they need an authenticated access. We'll be using other factors to make trust decisions, whether it's data, device, network, workload, et cetera. Um, we'll, and I'll add this in too, we'll have found a cost-effective solution to meet those logging requirements of M2131. I hope that answered the question. No, I appreciate you're going through uh, both the near and long-term and you raise a really key point about the um, uh, the level of funding probably isn't where it needs to be to meet all of the requirements. And so it gets CISOs like yourself being very creative and finding those resources. But clearly one of the other issues we often hear is, you know, how is a, a department like yours um, planning to implement zero trust principles across multiple um, uh, departments or bureaus within the Department of Labor, multiple networks, domains, and even functional silos? Well, such a great question. Thing. Um, certainly very, very important. We didn't want to go into this having each of our components creating their own path. We, we thought that was, that, that was going to hit a dead end eventually in being able to really realize the benefits of a zero trust architecture. Now, what I talked about, and, and I'm glad I mentioned this in previously, is about our enterprise shared services and consulting a lot of the IT under OCIO. Now, just because everything's consolidated under the OCIO doesn't mean those things are easy to do. There's still a lot of, uh, of different priorities and personalities involved there too. But it's to bring those along. 80% is consolidated under one network, under one basic infrastructure there, which makes this a little bit easier to manage. Now for the other 20%, I really think it comes down to making sure that this enterprise strategy that we've developed is inclusive. Meaning we didn't develop it in our 80% stovepipe, Wyatt, right? We said, hey, you other folks who aren't part of shared services, come along in here. Let's make sure that we're, we're considering your needs, your concerns, and your ideas. So we developed the strategy that's got principles in it and not necessarily a specific solution. 
Um, I do think that this is where the human aspect of IT comes in, right? So we, we, we need to partner and dialogue and collaborate with these other groups. And it's about relationships and it's about trust. You know, if we have told these groups, hey, we're going to consider your needs and concerns, we can't turn around and then not consider them then when we create the architecture. We need to be true to what we've, we're promising. Um, but I do believe that they all see that this is, this is going to improve their ability to perform their mission. So everything's about mission. And we can also certainly point to that executive order and they know that it's, a, it's not only a good idea, it's a requirement, right? Um, but we need to ensure these enterprise solutions are designed to appeal to their needs. And, uh, you know, certainly why I'm, I'm more a type of a CISO who I, I'd rather have our, our partners in the Department of Labor come along willingly and, and excited about this than, than, than me pulling them kicking and screaming into a, uh, you know, architecture that, that they don't want to be part of. But that's how we, we've been doing it. Paul, as you know, uh, it'd be one thing if zero trust was just kind of implemented uh, from scratch, but we're living in an environment where federal agencies still have a lot of additional compliance requirements uh, as they approach cybersecurity, much of which is codified by law. What concerns do you have about uh, federal zero trust adoption to ensure that agencies are actually able to achieve comprehensive versus piecemeal check the box security protections? Oh, great point. Um, so my opinion, that there is no benefit to putting in this effort and the money that's involved with it to check some compliance boxes. Our adversaries don't care about how we are doing with compliance boxes, right? Our, 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 our adversaries in the, out in the world aren't looking to see, well, how did you do on your last audit? We better be doing this to improve the protection of data and services to our stakeholders, whether they're internal or external. That's the key reason to do this. Um, I, I often talk to my, my, my friends and colleagues here about that, uh, our first and foremost, we need to be protecting the agency's systems and data. And, if we can check a few boxes by doing that, that's great. But our focus needs to be on protecting the systems and data. Now, that being said, I think we're all aware, and I'm as guilty of it as anyone else, what gets measured and rewarded or punished gets attention. We all realize that. So uh, it is important that, that OMB and, and DHS, uh, you know, specifically CIS and DHS, and our OIG partners need to make sure that what they're measuring are the protections and security rather than sort of a, a by the book is everything got the right signatures, is, is our records, you know, all those types of things. Let's make sure we're looking at security and protections. Now, a couple of initiatives are underway that I think are encouraging that I, I, I've been um, honored to be involved in. And one is OMB has an IT requirements working group that's um, going through all the historical and current uh, M memos and executive orders and everything else and, and, and making sure that what's in there is still meaningful today and reflects current priorities. And where it's not, they're either being rescinded or they're being updated. So I think this, this, that's gonna be helpful in kind of removing some of those uh, compliance requirements that aren't really meaningful anymore. Also, another group's working to right size and define the, the controls that are assessed in the OIG FISMA audits. Um, you may know that in the past, for the past year, that was defined what the core set was, which was about a third of the total number of controls. And, and we were looking to do that core set to be the ones that were most closely aligned with the executive order and other current initiatives. So I think there's some more work to be done in that area, but that's moving in the right direction, I, I think, as well. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's uh, good to hear. Uh, and then lastly, Paul, how is your department planning to unify automation and orchestration across the so-called five pillars of zero trust uh, to truly transform security? Well, I, I, Wyatt, I think that's where this design strategy comes in uh, of, of 
of doing this overlay, this sassy overlay, because without that as, as, as a glue that holds all these things together, all, all this, the data sources and pillars, I think we're at risk of, of having that piecemeal approach where we might have some good point solutions. You know, we, we've got great eye cam or great uh, user behavior analysis or where we're able to really tell down to a fine uh, uh, specific point about our device health. If these things aren't working together and, and, and being a coordinated way to, to pull information in to determine how much you're gonna trust that connection attempt, then, then we haven't met our, our goal here with the zero trust architecture. So going down to somewhat maybe of a more one level down technically. Um, so without that unifying solution, I mean, how are we going to pull all that really valuable information together to co coherently into like policy decision points and then over to a policy enforcement point so that both the decision and an action can be taken on using that data in, in real time. So we, at least in the department, we're going to be looking for that sassy provider that's got a proven experience in success with an environment like ours of pulling all that information together, making it usable to make these security decisions. Well, Paul Blahash, thank you so much for taking a few minutes to share uh, both your insights and uh, update us on where the Department of Labor is heading regarding zero trust uh, implementation uh, across your department. So thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure, Wyatt. Thanks for having me.